The Senate race in Georgia is just one of several contests that could determine which party controls the U.S. Senate come January. The latest CBS News polling shows Democrats are the underdogs ahead of Election Day next week. Let's bring in CBS News election, excuse me, Executive Director of Elections and Surveys, Anthony Salvanto. Anthony, I am pre-tired for you because I know what you've got <laughs> ahead of you. And, and uh, I mean, we're all going to be working late and hard, but you the most. So what is the... Um, what what is what is your what are your surveys saying about the current balance of power in the Senate and the House? So we give people the seats estimates, number of seats in which we think Republicans are leading right now. And I'm going to say it that way to sort of preface our, our conversation here about the polls. But that number is 228, which would give Republicans the majority. Mm -hmm. The other thing I put out along with that is an estimate that was is what would happen if Democrats turned out in stronger numbers than they currently say. They are. And that brings them just into contention to maybe, maybe hold the House, right? just, just at that 218 number. And then I put into the model, what happens if Republicans keep turning out at the rate that they say they're going to? And I put that in, and that gets them up higher into the 230s. You know, I put out that range because I want people to see a range of political possibilities, not just a margin of error. And, uh, you know, some people tweeted back, oh, that's wonderful. I get it. I have an understanding. And somebody else tweeted, you know, oh, so you have no idea what's going to happen. And the answer is both. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it, one of the reasons I'm so anxious to talk to you is, yes, to find out what, what your current uh, model shows you, but also to talk about how you put this model together. And just the point you raised is that we all expect the polls to be something that they aren't, sort of like a go the gospel of what's happening. But they're not. They are imprecise in the way that they're built. Talk about what you were just saying, which is that you have a model and it is based on some assumptions. But you've been consistently talking about how those assumptions, when they shift, shift the final outcome. Why do you do that? Well, I do that because so much of polling right now is a model. It's not just a sample. And when you say model, it's your best guess of what's going to happen. Well, it's a little more than that. What you've got are some underlying assumptions. Let me give yeah. you an example yeah. of how that works. Let's suppose I say, okay, these are likely voters. Well, how do I know someone's a likely voter? We have some back information about the number of people who say they're going to vote and then who actually do. Let's suppose that's 90% of them. Okay, so a likely voter is someone who's 90% likely to vote. That could be in the model. Let's suppose we know that people who habitually vote show up 80% of the time. Okay, someone that you can see on their voter record is a habitual voter, maybe gets an 80% likelihood. That's a model where you're putting in factors of the way the world works and assumptions about the way it's always worked. The problem, of course, is in any model, yes. if things go off, if things go off course in the sense that people make different decisions. Right, people behave like human beings and Go a different way. Uh, there's, there's, there's an old line. I, I, somebody said, I think they were an economist, and they were sort of pointing to the physics department down the hall, and they said, you know, the difference between us, the economists, and them is that the atoms that we study think for themselves. <laughs> and, you know, I always sort of like that line, even if, even if apocryphal, because I, it, 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 these people are making decisions. They're being influenced by campaigns. We want to understand that dynamic, but that defines the range of possibilities, not just, not just sampling error. And, and w so what you're doing is you're taking the best data about what you know about voter behavior and matching it to the actual voters that you are surveying mm -hmm. and kind of overlaying those. And that's your kind of strongest model. But then, as you say, and I'm belaboring the point because yeah. it, I think it's worth it. But then you, you sometimes say, well, let's say if voters change their, their behavior a little bit this way, then the model shows us something, and that's how you get your range. That's right. And, you know, it's an attempt to quantify the world, which is what social science is. It's often what, you know, what economics is. Um, at the same time, we've never had more data available to us, which is really the fun part of this, because we can use the voter file to get these numbers that I'm talking to you about. We know, we know the demographics of every district, so we can put that all in. But we're still, in some respects, at the mercy of the campaign, so they're trying to change those voters' minds. Tell me about the term margin of error, which is another thing I'd like to have you explain before I lose you. Yeah, we want to understand the fact that these estimates have ranges around them in which we think the true value is, but it's really the best we can do. Now, you can judge that and say, hey, it's amazing. You know, zero to 100 raise, you can get within three or four points of the right answer. But some people say, no, no, you've, you've got to tell me exactly who's going to win. And sometimes that, that can't be done. 
Look, imagine a race that's 51-49 between two candidates. In right. the case, you know, let's say, for example, the Georgia Senate race. You're going to put a range around that 51%. You're going to put a range around that 49%. And if those ranges overlap, that race is too close to call, as we might say on election night. Okay? Right. You can't really determine that one candidate is ahead as opposed to the other. And I always try to emphasize when people report on this, when I report on this, maybe don't call it a lead. Call it a close race. Define that uncertainty for people. That's what the margin of error is, effectively, for you. It's that range around the estimate. What, quickly, do you think will be the hard, biggest challenge in, on election night in terms of projecting these races and their outcomes? Well, the big change that's happened in the last few years is the way in which people cast their ballots, which right. is to say Democrats are now more likely to vote earlier by mail. Republicans more likely to vote on election day. And when we're looking at the data coming in, we'd better know which it is they're counting first, right. which it is that the counties are reporting to us and when. And that can be tricky because we've got to go get the reports, look at the data and say what's in that count. So that's something you'll hear me talk about a lot on election night, not just how many ballots, but what kind they are. And we'll remind people, of course, that whether the ballot comes in at the beginning of the night or the end of the night, it counts the same. Oh, absolutely. And have patience. Have right. patience. It may take a while, exactly. by definition, to count all. Have patience and put on the coffee. Anthony, thanks so much for being with us. <laughs> Thank you.